Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all and a, a privilege to be here as we have been worshipping God together in remembering the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great thing to be saved, great thing to know that we're able to meet here and meet with the risen Christ as those who love him and those who have been saved by him. We turn to the uh, last chapter in the book of Habakkuk, and if you uh, would open your Bibles there, we'll be referring to that chapter as we go through this for the last few minutes this morning. Um, now, <coughs> Habakkuk is uh, not too easy to find, but it's the fifth book back if you go to the end of the Old Testament. So you've got Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. I think that's one of the easiest ways to find it. Um, Habakkuk, it's a, a, a very touching story, a very human story. And it begins with a man in chapter 1 who, who's totally frustrated because he doesn't understand God. And he doesn't understand what God is doing. As far as he can see, God is not answering his prayer. The times he, are li he is living in are most annoying and frustrating. He, he, he's living among the people who had the Bible in its early form. He, had, he was living among the people who knew that God had delivered them from Egypt. He was living among the people to whom God had revealed himself. And yet, it was horrible. There was awful violence. People still worshipped in the temple, but they didn't live as if they knew God. And he was so frustrated and he says, Lord, help. And it didn't seem as if anything was happening. And so he said, Lord, how long will I cry? And you're not listening. He thought God was not answering his prayer. So in chapter 1, God gives him a bit of a surprise. He said, well, well actually, Habakkuk, I am answering your prayer. I cannot tolerate the sins of my people, and I am going to send the Babylonians to punish them. Jerusalem will be destroyed. Well, that didn't help Habakkuk very much. He thought, what? What sort of an answer is that to my prayer? Those Babylonians that you're going to use to punish us, they're actually worse than we are. So how can you do that? And so you move into chapter 2 then, and faced with this predicament now, Habakkuk says, look, Instead of focusing on the problem, I'm going to wait for God to answer. And he's no longer just focusing on the problem, but he now waits for God to explain it to him. And God tells him that he will use the Bible in this way, but that he is a just God. Sin must be punished. And so the time will come when the Babylonians also will be punished. And that is how God showed Habakkuk that he was in control of it all. Even though things would happen that would be terribly frustrating and difficult, he was in control. And so now we come to chapter 3 this morning. And in this chapter, we meet a prayer of Habakkuk. I don't know if you can see past me or not, can you? Sort of? Um, the prayer of Habakkuk, and it opens up with the word Shigionoth. So we'll read a few verses, and you will notice two words that are not in English. And then I'll say what they are. First of all, let's read a few verses from Habakkuk chapter 3. And look out for the two words which are not English. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigion note. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. 
in the midst of the years make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Selah. We'll end our reading there at the moment and come back and read more later on. But uh, the two words that are not English are Shigionot and the other one is Selah. And the reason they are not translated is because we don't know what they mean. Um, well, Shigionoth is probably something to do with music. Uh, at the end of this chapter, we're told that this prayer will be played on stringed instruments. Instruments. I'm getting the Hebrew and the English all muddled up now. And instruments in Hebrew would be nigionot. Nigginot. So nigginot, shigionot. So it's all something to do with music. And uh, uh, it's telling us that this prayer of his was made into a psalm that was played to music. And Selah, well, uh, some people think Selah has something to do with music as well. But it actually occurs at the end of some psalms. So it probably means think carefully about what you've just been singing or reading. But we, we're not sure. So we come to this prayer of Habakkuk that is set to music. And the first uh, passage of it mentions God's mercy. So we meet a man who's relying on God's mercy. After all he has been through, after all the surprises about what God is doing, his first thing is he's calling on God in wrath, remember mercy. But the way he remembers God's mercy is a little bit surprising because the first thing he says is, I have heard the report of you and your work I fear. Your work I fear. Uh, why fear? Fear is uh, sometimes in some translations it is translated I stand in awe of your work instead of fear. Why do some people translate it differently if it means fear? Well, it's because the fear of the Lord, fear can be quite understood in different ways. There are different levels of fear, different ways of being afraid. Um, last year, I was, um, had an appointment at the dentist's uh, with the hygienist. And as I was, uh, I know, well, that's fear for a start, you know, going to the dentist, especially if it gets into those drills that do all the high-pitched noise. Whoa! Uh, there's different ways of being afraid. But anyway, I, I, got, I, I learned about fear at a new level on that day because the hygienist had just nipped out before she uh, started to do the work. And I was talking to the dental nurse and suddenly she just swung round, looked at the open window and ran and grabbed a cloth and slammed the window shut and I said, what's wrong? And she said, did you not see? A little spider came in. And she said, the hygienist has got a problem called, can anybody pronounce this for me? Arachnophobia. And she says, if she sees a spider, she would freeze. And then she would run and leave the room. Even a teeny weeny little spider. It's got something, it, it would be uh, not a good idea for her to be working at your teeth if a spider came into the room. That sort of thing. So that there's different ways of, because that type of fear, uh, have you heard of that before? Different people are frightened of different things. But that type of fear is the sort of thing that makes you freeze. It, um, what did you say, it kind of, it doesn't help you. It uh, holds you back. It's um, detrimental fear. Whereas when we're talking about the fear of the Lord, we're not talking about something that 
that's detrimental. The fear of the Lord is a liberating fear. Because if you fear him, you have nothing else to fear. The fear of the Lord sets you free. Because you know that the creator of the ends of the earth is the only one that really is in control of our lives at all. Uh, fear, I like to think of the fear of the Lord as simply taking God seriously. It's not a, a, a fear that inhibits you, it's a fear that sets you free. That we are recognising who he is and he's not like us. He cannot tolerate sin and we need to take him seriously because God took sin seriously when his son died on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. And we must take him seriously and not treat him as if he's some great Santa Claus living in the sky. And sadly, there are many people today who know nothing of the fear of the Lord. They're not afraid of their sin. They're not afraid of meeting God. And that is a big mistake. If people are living in their sin, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So the fear of the Lord or fearing the works of the Lord is different from the sort of inhibiting fear that limits us. Fear of spiders, fear of uh, the dark, it limits you. Fear of the Lord sets you free. Because then we know we're in a relationship with him. And then we can pray as Habakkuk did. He said, in the midst of the years, uh, revive your work. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. He's praying that although judgment is coming upon sin, he prays that in the midst of it all, that God will graciously, in, when he's showing his disgust and his anger and his wrath against sin, Habakkuk says, in the midst of it all, Lord, please remember to be merciful. And of course, when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed and the people were taken into Babylon, God remembered mercy. He answered this prayer because even in Babylon you had people like Daniel. In fact, uh, there's a story that's not in the Bible. Well, to be honest with you, there's a very good reason why it's not in the Bible. Um, as I'll explain in a minute, a story that uh, is in the Apocrypha. And it describes this man Habakkuk. How that because he prayed that God would remember mercy, that during the time that Daniel was in the den of lions, Habakkuk was out uh, in the fields and he was taking some food to the people who were working there. And he met an angel. Now, now, I've said this is not in the Bible. He met an angel who said to him, you're not to give that food to these people here. They don't need it. They're not all that hungry. I want you to go to Babylon and give it to Daniel. And so the angel lifted him by the hair, it says. A kind of biblical hairways or something. He flew him by the hair to Babylon, let him down into the den of lions where he gave Daniel the food. So that is uh, one of the apocryphal stories that links Habakkuk with Daniel. And it's because that these stories arose because Daniel was praying, uh, or Habakkuk was praying that God would remember mercy. And when Daniel was facing those big lions, God was certainly showing his mercy and answering prayer. So he, and also people like uh, the three people who were thrown into the burning fiery furnace, God answered prayer. He showed mercy there as well. You know, God must punish sin, but he's also a merciful God. And we have been remembering the, 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 in the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup, we've been remembering how that in wrath, God remembered mercy. God showed his wrath against sin by that uh, terrible, 
terrible crucifixion of the Son of God that God so loved the world that he gave. And the wrath of God was poured out upon his Son that you and I might know his mercy. This morning we live because of the mercy of God. We will meet him as a merciful God because of what Jesus did, because of who Jesus is. We will meet God not as a God of wrath. We will not fall into the hands of an angry God. If we know him as our Lord and Saviour and he lives in our lives, we will experience mercy and not wrath. In wrath, remember mercy. On the cross, in wrath, God remembered mercy. Jesus experienced the wrath of God so that you and I could enjoy the mercy of God and his forgiveness. So that's the first thing, remembering God's, relying on God's mercy. And secondly, remembering God's acts. Uh, he, uh, we will read a few more verses, but he mentions in the verse we read in three, God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, and rays flashed from his hands. There he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. Now that's wonderful poetry, but what's it about? Well, it's remembering what God did when he brought Israel out of Egypt. He says, God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Well, that goes back to the time when Moses was praising God for delivering them from Egypt, because in Deuteronomy, Moses, oops, there's a bit of it missing. Never mind, I'll read it out to you. In the book of uh, Deuteronomy, in 33 verse 2, Deuteronomy also, uh, through Moses, mentions Mount Paran. The Lord came from Sinai, where he gave the Ten Commandments, and dawned from Seir upon us, and uh, he came from Mount Paran. So this is taking us right back to the time when God delivered his people from the land of Egypt. He came from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. God did the impossible. He delivered slaves from the bondage of Egypt and set them free and they were called to remember this and this is what this man Habakkuk is saying you're still the same God who delivered Israel from the land of Egypt let's see what's happening here uh, okay let's forget about that a bit of it seems to have dropped out um, so the I've got pictures of the wilderness of the dreadful wilderness that God had brought his people through. All the great things, remembering what God had done in the past. And you know, we have been doing exactly that this morning. We've been remembering the great thing that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, the great things that he did through his lifetime. And also, it's good through our lives to remember that this same God who was in giving himself on the cross, the same God loves you and me so much that he looks after us day by day. And that whatever is happening, you know, it's not, we're not on our own in this world. God doesn't just save us and leave us there. He cares for us day by day and hour by hour. And I'm sure we can all remember times when we have really been blessed and it's good to keep those memories, especially through the dark times. It's good to remember the times when God has richly blessed us and not just to forget about them. Uh, when, when I started, to, after I left Bible college, I went into a scripture gift mission. And there was a lovely man there who was retiring called Robert Bell. I think some of you might know him. Uh, Robert Bell was... Uh, 
uh, in charge of scripture gift mission for the whole of Ireland. And I was taking over from him. Well, you know, I was from Ballymena and like never really had traveled very much. Like when we went up to Belfast occasionally, you sort of uh, canceled the milk and switched off the electricity. You know, it just was, traveling was not something I was into. So when I found that I was in charge of the whole of Ireland, wow, that blew my mind away. And I thought, and he said, don't worry, I'll take you down, I'll introduce you to friends and I'll show you all around. Uh, and, but it didn't happen that way because when we had planned the trip, which he planned, he took ill and I had to go on my own. Not in his car, which was reasonably reliable, but in my student car, which eventually I sold for £12. So, you know, but, but anyway, uh, I was doing all this motoring down the south. And one night when I came to the place I was staying, the car got me to the front door and then went and in a puff of steam, that was it. It died. So the man of the house came out and said, are you having problems? And I said, I am. Big trouble. Because I was in the middle of nowhere. And uh, he looked at it and he said, oh, I'll tell you what. Uh, your um, cylinder head has gone. You'll not be going anywhere until you get that skimmed. You'll need to get that done in a factory. And my heart sank because I didn't really have the money to pay for it for a start. And he said, and I said, you're not a mechanic by any chance? And he said, no, I'm not, I'm not a mechanic, but I'm an engineer. And my job is to skim cylinder heads. So he says, uh, uh, I'll not do it tonight, but I'll get it done for you in the morning. It'll not cost you anything. And I just thought to myself, you know, isn't that a great reassurance? Isn't that something worth remembering? And then I blew it a bit, because when I got home to Belfast, I was so excited about this, and I had a meeting in a little Presbyterian church, and I was telling them all about this, and how that God looked after me. And at the end of the service, the minister got up and said, well, that's interesting. Last week, I was going down the M2 and there's five lanes of traffic and my car broke down in the worst possible place and God never sent a mechanic to help me out. <laughs> well, you know, I wasn't very happy with him. I th thought he's, he's blown my story. But in the end of the day, what he had said was right, that it's great to remember the great times. But it's also great to remember that we live in a world which is a sinful world and everything isn't perfect and God won't always help us in that way but I was still thrilled that on my debut to the south of Ireland God had saved the day and sent an engineer when I needed one but it doesn't happen like that all the time because we don't live in a perfect world and it was good of that minister to say that though I hated him for it at the time. So uh, the God is uh, wonderful. He has done things for us. Let us constantly remember week by week what Jesus has done and remember day by day the blessings that God has given us. Remember to be thankful for the water we drink and the clothes we wear and the health and strength we've got to be here. Thank God and let us remember it. The Israelites do this once a year. They remember in the Passover. And in a Passover feast, they don't just think that God saved those people in Egypt uh, 3,000, 3,500 years ago. They think, I have been delivered from slavery. So it's remembering what God has done. Well, the uh, Habakkuk goes on. We read verse 6 now. And he says, He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations and the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. He remembers how that God dealt with all the enemies. He's the creator God. And he was able to open up the Red Sea. He was able to open up the Jordan River. And he was able to cause the sun and the moon to stand still. Uh, it says in uh, verse 11, 
the, verse 11, the sun and the moon stood still in their place. This was the story of when Joshua was fighting the enemy and it was beginning to get dark and he prays that the sun and the moon would stand still so that uh, it was one of those situations where you could see the sun on one side and the moon on the other. And he prays that they would stand still so that the battle could be won. The people that he was fighting against believed that the sun was a god. And they believed that the moon was a god. But Moses didn't believe that the sun was a god. But he believed he knew the God who made the sun and the God who made the moon. The God who made those great mountains. The God who made the rivers. And so he was able to pray to him and, 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 and get that victory. And so Habakkuk is remembering how great God is. And he knows that uh, hard times are coming. But God hasn't changed. And God isn't taken by surprise by anything in history and in this pandemic that we're going through it doesn't surprise God and it doesn't limit him he's the living God who made all that we see around us and when we remember his great acts we remember that we should never feel depressed or downhearted because our God is mighty he's the God who answers prayer and he can see us through so finally, um, Habakkuk remembers in his prayer the great things that God has done. And finally, he uh, has this little message. You've got relying on God's mercy, remembering God's acts, and rejoicing in God's presence. It's one of the most wonderful passages in the Old Testament. He doesn't say, I'll be happy if, uh, I'll be happy if nothing goes wrong. I'll be happy if all this judgment doesn't come. I'll be happy if God changes his mind. No, he says, I'll be happy anyway, because I can rejoice in him. So have you got those three points? Relying on God's mercy, remembering God's acts, and rejoicing in God's presence. He says, although the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the product of the olive shall fail. The fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, he makes my feet, as we were singing earlier, he makes my feet like the deer's, he makes me tread upon the high places. So Habakkuk has come from, has come on a journey really, a journey in which he faced frustration, became confused, exercised faith and found peace. We've been looking at his journey in, in three weeks, but one of the very first sermons that I ever preached was based on Habakkuk as a whole, and I came up with a little sermon outline which I will leave with you because it has always been a blessing to me. This was taking the whole three chapters together that Habakkuk was a man faced with problems, faithful in prayer and filled with peace. Does not just sum it all up. It just the first chapter faced with problems. The second chapter faithful in prayer and this little bit here though the fig tree doesn't blossom I will find joy in the God of my salvation filled with peace and that's what I leave with you this morning that when we are living in this world a world of sin a world that is judged by God we will be faced with problems I think we can all say that can we all identify with that be pretty strange if somebody says, no, I don't have any problems. We're all faced with problems. So let's be faithful in prayer. But don't just leave it there after you've been faithful in prayer. Be filled with peace 
knowing that God answers prayer and that he will never leave us alone. Amen.